Hi, welcome back to FAIR TV. I'm Peter Hart. The People's Climate March brought over 300,000 people to the streets of New York City on September 21st to demand action. It happened on a Sunday morning. That's when the media elite gather on the network chat shows to discuss what they see as the important issues of the day. The largest climate action ever didn't make the cut. There were other, more important matters. On Meet the Press, host Chuck Todd explained that the partisan divide in the country is kind of like the difference between two corporate chains. There was one exception, though. Nation editor Katrina Vanden Heuvel mentioned the march on ABC's This Week. A catastrophic climate crisis, which the Pentagon has called a clear and emerging danger. There are 100,000 people marching outside this uh, studio this today because of that. The problem wasn't just with the Sunday chat shows, though. The march got very little attention across television. NBC Nightly News stood out for filing a report the day of the march, but there wasn't much else to be found in corporate media. It poses a pretty fundamental question. If this wasn't a good time to cover the climate crisis, when will be? On September 22nd, TV networks began reporting that the United States had launched military attacks on Islamic State group strongholds in Syria. The attacks came after waves of media coverage playing up the threat the group posed to the United States, though many intelligence analysts say that there is no kind of immediate threat to the U.S. homeland. The attacks brought to mind a familiar trope about Barack Obama's foreign policy, that he either doesn't wage enough war or that he does so with an inefficient level of enthusiasm. It was a remarkable moment for a reluctant warrior. He has not been assertive in using U.S. power and indeed seems to be somewhat ashamed of it. But now, with weekly beheadings by ISIS, the reluctant warrior must wage war, but not total war, tepid war. You're saying he's the reluctant warrior, so can the reluctant warrior lead uh, in a situation where we don't know what the end game is? Yeah, I think is. so. He's gotten somehow turned tonight from being that reluctant warrior to being an actual warrior against ISIS, against ISIL. Gloria, is he going to become a warrior and not a reluctant warrior? Now, this assertion heavily influences the elite debate about U.S. foreign policy. Obama has been very reticent to use force. His supporters say this is a good thing, evidence that he takes these matters very seriously. His hawkish critics, who tend to get a lot more TV time, responded to the strikes on Iraq and Syria by saying more or less, well, it's about time. But a more accurate assessment of Obama's foreign policy would note, as journalist Glenn Greenwald did, that Obama has waged war on a number of countries already. The rhetoric about Obama's supposed reluctance serves both his critics and supporters. But more important than that, it obscures this fundamental reality. And finally, part of the administration's war plan involves getting other countries in the region on board. Time magazine covered that aspect of the story in a September 18th piece. But what was especially jarring and revealing was a reference to U.S. foreign policy priorities. Michael Crowley reported that during a meeting with Egypt's foreign minister, Secretary of State John Kerry, quote, was forced to respond gingerly when asked about local human rights abuses, a longtime U.S. concern in the repressive country. The idea here is that the need to strike deals now over this war is trumping human rights concerns. But it's hard to square that claim with reality. The United States was a strong supporter of Egyptian dictator Hosni Mubarak for decades. Deep concern about human rights was expressed in the form of billions of dollars every year in U.S. aid. A WikiLeaks cable showed that the Obama administration actually decided to pull back from publicly criticizing Mubarak's human rights record. The initial response to the Arab Spring demonstrations against Mubarak were to issue statements of support for him. And when Egyptian President Mohamed Morsi was removed from power in a coup last year, the United States refrained from calling it one. Hundreds were killed following that coup. The military leader who oversaw it, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, is now the president. It's never surprising when the U.S. government, or any other government for that matter, signals its deep concern for human rights. But journalism is supposed to serve as a check on that kind of rhetoric. I'm Peter Hart. Thanks for tuning in to FAIR TV.